Now we're moving into our top 10 list for the week. How to increase personal performance and productivity, especially in the evolving modern work landscape. It requires a combination of technology, mindset, and habits. Here are the top 10 ways to enhance your productivity and performance amidst these changes. Number one, establish a dedicated workspace. Even if you're working from home, a designated a specific area as your workspace. This helps psychologically to prepare work time and separate it from personal time. I'm gonna swing over here. What do you think about a dedicated workspace? I have to say it is a very smart move. And uh, for example, this morning you found me in your office and I found that that is the place where I can actually completely, mostly completely disconnect from everything else and drop completely into focus on work and be really productive and uh, not distracted. So I love that. Uh, you know that I have worked from all sorts of places in the home, from the kitchen table to the kitchen counter to a closet to a couch to a bed. The and roof, the meditation chair. Yeah, I work all over the place, and it kind of depends on how I'm feeling. But also I have to say that uh, most recently I've rejoined a co-working space because I personally find that working from home while it's so beautiful and easy and you just go to your refrigerator and get a snack and see your family, I find that it's it it starts to permeate permeate into everything and it's harder to drop into flow and be really productive. And I find that the best work that I can produce and create and how I can serve comes from a deep flow state. And when I'm too distracted by so many other things because I'm working in a very open or public space in the house or in a room where anyone can come in and out, it's so much harder to focus. And then I don't feel like I'm actually doing a good enough job. I actually feel more, f uh, not just focused, but I feel so much more accomplished and I feel proud and not exhausted when I find a workspace dedicated to that, whether it's your office or it's my co-working space. And I'm, I have energy after when I am working from a more communal place, like the kitchen table, kitchen counter, bedroom, where people are going in and out. I am exhausted by the end of the day because my brain is trying to process so many things. Who's coming in? Who's going out? What do they want? What do they need? Who's at the door? Uh, who needs to, oh gosh, what happened to our son? You know, everything versus escaping into this little workspace. So I a thousand percent recommend this and I, I hope that everyone does that, especially with this new work from home culture or movement, which is beautiful. But I, I think we really have to take into consideration the mental capacity and wear yep. on when we're trying to do too many things all in the same space. Yeah. Um, I've had the opportunity to do just about every combination in this category. I've had a work at the office situation. I've had a work from home when my home was a bedroom slash closet slash office without a door. I just had a curtain. That was my <laughs> setup in the beginning. Um, I've had the situation of having my living room as the office and my bedroom as the bedroom. I've had the situation of having my desk in my bedroom where I'm, I'm you know, sleeping and then rolling over and sitting in the chair at the desk. Um, and then as we've grown and evolved, I've always technically worked from home in, in the majority of my business. And in doing that though, I learned at some point, when I was a single guy before we met, I had a two bedroom apartment. I had an office, a living room, and a bedroom. <laughs> and I was very adamant about that. Like I needed a workspace and a living space. And it was different. And I, when I was in my workspace, I was working. And I was in my living space, I was living. L-I-V-I-N, man, like it was, the ability to switch those. And the person who helped me the most on this was actually a, a book writing coach. I remember I hired her and she says, one of the first things I need you to do because 
I've wor- she's worked with thousands of authors, and they have writer's block. They have trouble staying consistent with writing so many pages or words a day. They have trouble finishing their work. They have trouble just coming up with just the right thing to write about. And all this is, is as much as it's a passion and an art to write a book, it, it's work. It's getting your, your message out into the world. And she said, the number one thing I need you to do, I need you to have a workstation where you, you this is your author station. Nothing else happens. This is, the, this is where you write a book. You don't talk on the phone here. You don't text here. You don't email here. You don't talk to people. Nothing happens. When you sit in this chair and you s- use this pen at this desk with this binder or this book or this computer, you write. That is it. She said, I need you to have a writing outfit. The, you need a cape or a hat or a cloak or whatever you wear when you write. And you do nothing else in that outfit except for write this book. I need you to have writing music. I need you to have writing scents, smells. I need you to have writing sounds. I need you to have a writing temperature. I need this entire environment set that when you turn it to that setting, your brain knows now is the time to write the book. And I went, ooh, this sounds interesting. And I said, how does this work? What you're doing is setting a trigger that's going to set off a routine. And later there was books written about this, The Power of Habit, Atomic Habits. They talk about trigger, routine, reward. And so she was setting a trigger. The trigger was the place, the sound, the sight, the touch, the feel, the environment setting dialed in like a radio station to a very specific setting that you would tune into the environment. And once the environment was properly tuned in, it would activate a routine, a routine of creative flow, a routine of writing and expressing, a routine of capturing who you're talking to and expressing what they need to hear, know, and feel through the book. And then there was a reward. She goes, you're going to do it in segments, which we'll talk about in a few minutes here, but you're going to do it in segments. And after each segment, you're going to get up, you're going to take off the writing cloak, you're going to set down the writing pen, you're going to turn off the writing computer, you're going to clear the space, You're going to go to another space and do something for five minutes to enjoy yourself. Then you're going to come back and you're going to retune in the environment so that your maximum productivity, your maximum flow of ideation and creativity is going to come through you. And you're going to practice this back and forth and watch what happens. And the very first time I ever worked on a book, I did this. I was amazed. Zero writer's block, zero lack of creativity. It was like I could turn on that flow state instantly and have it just going and then I'd stop go do something else and it was great and so I proceeded to try to do that with every part of my my living environment there was a meditation station there was an eating place there was a learning place there was a relaxation place there was a sleep and making love place there was a uh, you know, space and place for everything. That way my body knew exactly what it needed to be doing when I'd enter the space. And then I got married. And then what happened? Everything is everywhere space. <laughs> I, I'm i just kind of learning this about you, actually. <laughs> I'm like, who is this coach and when did you work with her? Yeah. That makes a ton of sense that you separate it. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I think that I can blur the lines of a lot of things and I can also really appreciate the beauty of having spaces dedicated to certain things. Yeah. No, I think the gift is you bring a lot of color to my world. Thanks. Because I was a bit black and white when you met me. Very productive. But there, were, there was places to do things and places to not do things. I'm just living. L-I-V-I-N. L-I-V-I-N, man. <laughs> And so that, that's, that's the magic of other humans because here's what's fun. All of you will learn this. No matter how well you set up your space, if you're married or have a significant other or have animals and pets or have children or have someone or something else in your world, um, don't be too rigid. <laughs> I had to learn this because life will test your ability to flex and flow by giving you people who quote unquote mess up your perfect environments, they're not messing it up. They're bringing a little life and fun to it. So learn to enjoy the life and fun. Learn to, you know, enjoy things being a little out of order. 
Would um, it, I have a question on the rigidity because I know there's a lot of people that probably some people this is like whoa like to me I'm like wow that's a brilliant idea I should do that I'm going to try that out other people they might already be doing that and there might be someone else in their life that is kind of like not in alignment or doesn't understand that what talk to me about the rigidity like what do people get from that and why do they do that um, so the rigidity, why people do, why I did that, I can't speak to other people, I can tell you my experience. Mm. So my experience, when I was optimizing to get stuff done, mm. I was optimizing for how quickly and how efficiently can I get through it, even down to the grocery store. Mm. I knew if I entered through the door on the left at Sprouts Market, I could get all the things I needed, starting with the produce, moving over to the fish, grabbing the grains, getting a couple snacks and picking a line, depending on how many people were in line, I could get in and out of that store within 10 to 12 minutes. Mm. Now that was important because I was studying, working, trying to have a life and have fun, working out every day, trying to meditate, trying to read external books beyond just the books for school, trying to be a good student, trying to have a job. Like there's so many things I was trying to do all at the same time. I didn't have the luxury of just flowing through the grocery store and if it takes 20 minutes or 10 minutes or mm. 30 minutes i wasn't able to get all the things done that i wanted to do mm. and so because there's so much i'd love to fit into every day often more things than day meaning there's more stuff i want to do than time available mm -hmm. i have to pick and choose and so the least and it was before i could afford to hire someone to go do something like grocery shopping Mm. So I had to do it myself. I wasn't mm. in a luxurious place where I'm like, oh, just send someone to the store to grab our stuff for us and we'll keep working on the things we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was forced to choose, do I spend five more minutes at the grocery store or do I get to meditate today? Mm. Do I spend 10 more minutes doing this now or do I get to go to yoga and treat my body really well? Mm -hmm. And I have to choose between those things. And so that maximum productivity, the rigidness was the more, the more I could get more done in less time, mm -hmm. the more life I could go live and the more fun things I would have a chance to go fit into my day. I see. So you're trying to fit in as much as humanly possible while still having some time to just live and be. Totally. So Because if I didn't get the work done, <laughs> I didn't get the reward of having fun. So when did... I don't think it's completely switched, but when was there starting to be a shift because you're not as rigid anymore and you're definitely more into you you are a you're a being. You're not just a doing. Like you're definitely high productive, but I feel like now there's more a little more flex and flow and even when I get hyper focused on something, you're like just be. Yeah, I've been married to you for 10 years. Oh, it was me? I did that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fascinating. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. But I learned that from you, though. I know. So I was, I introduced it to you, but you reflected it back to me, and now I, I'm a beer being, <laughs> too. <Yeah. laughs> That's so beautiful. What cool gifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really support each other in that. Yeah. Cool. Number two, set clear boundaries. With the blur between work and personal life, it is crucial to set clear work hours and stick to them. Inform family or housemates about your work hours to reduce distractions. What do you think of this one? One of our clients had said, oh, this one got me so good, after his father passed away I believe it was he took some time off to to be with family to grieve to celebrate his dad's life and everything and, and passing and one thing that he shared with us was that he realized that work will slip into will yeah. try to work its way into every minute of your life yeah. if you let it yeah. and that just got me so good I don't know what it was I don't know if it's that life is precious and life is short moment that we're rem reminded of when, when people are going through, you know, someone passing or if it was, I was working really hard and I was trying to get a lot of things done that I found myself, maybe that was happening, but whatever it was, 
that stuck out to me so much and is such a realization to put boundaries specifically around work yeah. because uh, I mean, if you have a job, uh, let's be real, you're disposable. And if you have your own business, it will most certainly, the to-do list never ends with what you need to accomplish. However, the things that are most precious to us, our loved ones, our health, um, the things that really matter in our life, we have to prioritize those. And to me, it's keeping boundaries around those things to protect them and then work. Like, yes, set a boundary around it, but also realize like to protect more of the space for the things that really matter and then work, you're here and I'll get to you. And what I love about this, for example, with us, we have two day dates. Like we have two dates a week and I love it so much. And they're not short, like they're, they're, they take up most of the day, I love it. It's made me have to like fit in work into a very small space, which I love, I wanted that, I wanted to be a mom for, I wanted to be, you know, a wife and a mom and work would be part-time. I've said that from the very beginning that once I'm a mom, I don't necessarily want to work full-time. I will if I have to, but I want to be a, like more of an engaged full-on mom. Um, and so it's funny cause that's really what happened is like we have two, I have two days blocked off for us. And then I have a work day that fits in the three days. And I, I've, I kind of, the workhorse in me was challenged with that. But the, the smarter, like the more efficient and like work smarter, not harder, uh, part of me really stepped in and was like, hey, if you want to really do this thing and do this work and really, you know, show up and serve, this is the, this is the container. This is the space that you get to do it in. So only focus on the things that really matter in that category. So I think for some people that are, you know, feel like, ah, oh, but, but, but I got to do this and this. One thing that you've said was the work, the to-do list will never ever end. So accepting that first and then second, getting really crystal clear on of that list, what is the most important thing? And so what's so beautiful is I, because of uh, my limited work time, because I choose to, uh, to prioritize our love and relationship and our marriage, and I choose to prioritize uh, being a mom and, and spending a lot of time with our son and, and our home and everything, I have to be really smart with the time that I do have with work. So the boundaries are everything. And I have to say, I feel so fulfilled in every category. When I don't have the boundaries in place, things get blurry and messy and I don't feel like I'm ever doing enough in any one of those categories. But the second you put in a boundary, you start showing up a lot different because you're not just getting bogged down with noise. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. This is, this is one of those things for me. I had a client that I've been working with for about a year, maybe eight months, who reached out and I said, hey, how's it going? And they said, oh man, we're busier than we've ever been. And my gut true response was, that sucks. And he looked at me, he goes, what are you talking about? It's great, like we're growing like crazy, our, our numbers are up, our, our team is growing, everything. I mean, we're just busy, busy, busy. I just, and my question is, the reason I responded that way, my question is, what is your outcome? Like, are you being busy to be busy? I, I've seen, and you said this to me, because you came out of the corporate world, and when you came to me, you said so many people pride themselves on out-busying each other. I have more meetings. I have more things. I have more stuff. And, and it's a community of people who who've, they take pride in how busy they can be. And what I've learned is it's not about being busy. It's about being productive. Can you get the most important things done? We had a coach we worked with for years who worked with us and they kept having us look at our schedule and say, is that absolutely critical for this, for this to work? If it's not, remove it. And I just kept peeling things off my schedule one after the next, after the next, after the next, until all of a sudden I was only doing the most important things that actually move the business forward. And as we did that, I had a ton of free time. And our numbers grew by a couple hundred percent over three years. And I was looking at it and we were making more profit in a month than we used to make in a year. And I was going, how is this possible? I'm doing less. I'm only doing the most important things. 
we're making more revenue, we're helping more people, we're making more profit than ever before. Like my brain was confused because it didn't make sense. But it was amazing because we were only doing the most important things. And so these, this concept of setting boundaries, um, I think we're taking it beyond the, the piece here. It's saying, you know, set your, your start time and your stop time for work. Let people in your office or let people in your, wherever you're working know, hey, I'm working during these hours. Please don't interrupt me. Um, but when you take the concept of boundaries and you start putting them in other places, it allows you to then have more freedom. I think one of my favorites, we, we might talk about a four-day work week a little bit here. We've been having a four-day work week for a long time. We just don't say it that way. If you think about it, we work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, half day on Monday, and half day on Friday. That's technically a four-day work week. And so we've been doing that for a long time, mainly because my belief is we should start our week and end our week on giving each other our best selves. What does that mean? So many people wake up and, and they have this amazing morning routine where they, they journal and breathe and meditate and work out and cold plunge and sauna and they do all this stuff to be their best selves. And then they take their best selves and they pour it into work. And I was like, that's great and all, but shouldn't you give your best self to the ones you love first and then give the rest to work instead of giving your best self to work all day? and giving what's ever left over to the ones you love. And the moment I had that thought and distinction, I went, dude, I'm going to do it. I'm going to wake up Monday morning. I'm going to work out, meditate, do my breath work, journal, sauna, do all my things. And then the first person I'm going to share all that energy and all that goodness with is my wife. I want her to have all the best of me. And once I've shared that from 9 a.m. till noon, we go on a walk, we go surfing, we go explore waterfalls, we go have lunch together, we fit all kinds of little dates and we go hiking, whatever we do, we fit it into that 9 a.m. till noon, then we come back, then I start the work week after I've given my best to the one I love most. Same thing on Fridays. Work all week, get done on Thursday night, set everything up so that Friday morning, wake up, work out, to, you know, head into the weekend, I give my best to my wife. And then at noon, we get back, we come record this podcast, we do a few other things to wrap up the week, and we're done. And it's that thought of, we've set boundaries around work. I said, hey, can in four days a week, can I get everything that needs to get done, done? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes I need to sneak in an, a few hours on an afternoon on a Saturday or Sunday to get something done. Sometimes we, we're traveling or have a speech or something we have to do. But 90% of the time, we've figured out how to get our work into those four, four days a week and how to make the most time available for each other in it and around it. So set those boundaries. Number three, time blocking instead of multitasking. Set specific blocks of time to tackle specific tasks. This includes setting aside time for breaks and personal activities as well. I'm a huge fan of time blocking. Huge fan of this. What are your thoughts on time blocking? You are really great at time blocking. Yep. I have struggled with it a lot. And I'm I, and every once in a while, like right now, I'm, I'm getting back into it. Jarek has this amazing, uh, like, time block schedule calendar where we you can call see it, we call it a time budget yes and every day you can see what is dedicate what hour is dedicated to what activity or or thing or person mm -hmm. and it's so beautiful and i think i was really struggling with like how things fit in and i felt like i just had so much to do and i didn't know where it fit in and uh, I did this and it worked a ton. The time blocking works so much because then I can actually, and I'm very visual, so I could really see, okay, these are my hours dedicated to working out or filling my cup. These are the hours dedicated to us. These are the hours dedicated to my son. So these are the hours dedicated to um, different work outcomes or whatever, meetings or trainings. And it's been such a game changer. I think that uh, it helps you mentally prepare for what's to come so you're not just like being you know 
I don't know, dragged through the day or just like feeling like you're out of control of it. And instead you can see exactly what you're dedicating. And you can also see what, why you feel the way that you feel. Sometimes you're like, oh, I'm so exhausted. And I don't know why. It's like, well, you didn't schedule any break time or you didn't schedule, you haven't, when we weren't doing weekly dates or we'd fall off for some reason or, you know, schedule or life happens, it happens. Um, we could look back and go, ah, we need to time block this time for us. And we do. And it's amazing. So now we feel more connected than ever. And it's obvious why, because if you look at your calendar or your, your time budget and you can see, ah, this is why I feel so loved and connected and cherished by my husband. This is why I feel so, you know, I had back to back to back to back calls on this day. That's why I feel a little talked out. <laughs> I have no words left. Uh, it makes a ton of sense. So I think there's, there's so beautiful. Your brain can uh, mentally prepare for what's to come. You can also evaluate after why you feel the way you feel. And then you can optimize what needs to change. So for me, again, I wasn't doing it. And when I started to time block, I can then m get in the zone and get prepared and really show up. I know the energy. I know the routine. I know what's to come. I can put focus in and find flow there. And then I can turn it off and go to the next thing. There's no guessing. And, and it's beautiful. I love it. I and love you're really great at it. I love this concept. <laughs> so this concept definitely changed my life because what was happening in my world is coaching to me is a very creative process, meaning I need to be in flow. I need to be ready on my toes. I never know what's going to be said. I need to ask you know, useful and, and insightful questions to help it spark that insight for them. I need to challenge people. I need to be energized and excited and there for them and really make space, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual space for them. And to go from that to, oh, accounting, I need to get my books done. My brain would feel like it would explode. Where I'm like, oh, it's like trying to switch gears without stepping on the clutch. It just doesn't <laughs> make sense. It's like <laughs> grinding my own mental gears. And so I literally took a time management and productivity course one time. And he shared the simplest thing that made the biggest difference, which was group like and similar activities with other like and similar activities. Yes. And I remember sitting there and being like, okay, Captain Obvious, why didn't I think of this before? And it was so simple. It was like, take logical, mathematical, you know, if you're an architect, like, like structural things with, with hard boundaries and rules and put all that stuff together. And then take flow, you know, the right brain, creative, flowy, um, art, art, you know, artistic kind of stuff and put all that together. Put your phone calls and people-y stuff together. Put your spreadsheets and number stuff together and chunk it. So it's like left brain activities, right brain activities, high energy activities, end the day activities, begin the day activities, you know, relaxing activities literally chunk them all together and then place them in giant blocks throughout your week so that you can just shift into that technical gear and then stay in that gear until all things are done. Then you can switch into your people -y gear and, and stay in that gear until all meetings are done. Because trying to go from a budget preparation meeting into a sales pitch is a big gear shift. And I've watched people do this. Um, I had an, a year and a half stint as president and chief strategy officer of Success Enterprises. And we were part of a large organization that was on Wall Street and had thousands of employees. And I watched some of these co-leaders or executives go from a budget meeting to a marketing meeting to a creative meeting to a team meeting to an HR meeting to a something else. And I was like, ugh, they do a not so great job at time chunking and blocking. Now, that's just how life is in corporations as executives. It is where it is. They don't have much control over that. In small business world that I live in, I definitely have control over this. Knock on wood, luckily. Um, so when I set my week, I, I do this process. It's something we do with our business accelerator clients where we have a full-time budget. And we color code everything and we put giant blocks throughout the week of when, when and where and why we do certain things. 
and it is an absolute game changer. Mentally frees you up, emotionally makes you feel alive again, and, and, and it gives you certainty, but lots of space for creativity and flexibility. It's wonderful. I highly recommend this. Uh, number four, leverage technology and use productivity tools, like apps like Trello or Asana or Notion, to organize tasks and have help with virtual communication tools like Zoom or Slack to keep you in connection with your team. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know how else you'd stay in connection with your team or organize projects. I think this is a great tip. And uh, my recommendation would be to not jump from thing to thing to thing to thing. Yeah. I think that there's so many different options for task management, so many different options for communication, and oh, then you're we've jumping done so from many. We have, and, <laughs> um, and it's tempting. It's almost like shiny object syndrome. I think what our brain is chasing is, will this make my life easier, yeah. faster, more efficient, yeah. whatever. L we're always looking for less. Our brain wants to conserve energy. And so, th but whatever you're doing, just, just, Focus on keeping it simple and keeping it outcome focused instead of like what's the latest and greatest because you're r it, when, since we're talking about productivity, there is a huge what is the word? It's the um, I forget the word that is the switching cost. The switching cost of going from this software to that software to this app to that app, yeah. you're losing time. There is cost in that of money, of time, of energy, of resources to make that switch. So before you do, really vet it out. Don't let the marketing just sell you on this is the latest and greatest thing. And in fact, if anything, and you've given two really great examples of where you've hired someone to help master something, master your spaces and your creation, master your time and productivity. You are really great at that. And I would say the same for this. Instead of being like, I, I will speak to my own experience. I've heard so many great things about Notion. I have tried Notion. I've not really got into it. I know it's a powerhouse of a tool. We tend to use Asana. You've used Trello. Uh, I've just kind of decided I've, I've spent so much time, money, and energy and resources in switching that we're just going to stick with this one. And when we do, if we do decide to switch, we're bringing in a pro. Yeah. We're bringing in a pro to make sure that when we make the switch, one, we're saving as much time, energy, and resources, our switching costs is as low as possible. And two, we're getting the most out of it. Yeah. And that actually makes sense from an efficiency standpoint and productivity standpoint. Because otherwise, it's a, such a headache. And for your team to be switching and switching and switching, what a headache and what a loss of production or efficiencies and just frustration. So just whatever you're doing, make the most of it, make it rock. And if you decide to switch, bring in a pro. <laughs> I agree 10,000%. Um, I've definitely hopped from software to software thinking it was going to be the magic sauce that would fix everything in my world and help me get more done in less time and all this stuff. And the reality is you spend so much time trying to learn the new one that it's just a distraction. A and so, I mean, we're setting up a new affiliate program for our core four challenge group. And the first thing I did was not try to log in and figure it out. I, I called the company and just said, hey, do you have any experts, people who've done this a thousand times that know how to do it, that I can just hire and have them set it up exactly for the outcome we're looking for? They know how to do it. They know what they need. They know exactly how to put it together. Luckily, they wrote me back and said, we do it complimentary for new members. I was like, great. What do you need? They sent me a list of all the things that they needed. I sent it back to them. They are now in the background putting it all together for me so that it is handled. And done well. And the key is I could have spent probably days, if not weeks, trying to figure this out and testing it and messing it up and, and fiddling with it. And I've just learned it's not worth doing that. Um, the good news is if you don't have the opportunity to just hire someone to do it for you, what you can do is at least start on YouTube. At least go straight to YouTube and look up someone to walk you through how to do it. That way you're not in there fiddling around yourself trying to come up with your way to do it. Like you literally can learn from experts online and very quickly adopt new technology or new information. Um, I think this one's kind of a given though. In today's modern workplace, 
get on Slack, get in, get in, uh, you know, project management dashboards. That way, with a remote team working from lots of different places, everyone can be doing their part to move things forward and seamlessly communicating with each other, even though they're all over the world on different time zones and different situations in different cities, but all collaborating together online. It's very useful. Uh, number five, prioritize tasks. Use the Eisenhower box or the Pareto principle, 80-20 me method, to focus on the most important pieces that will yield the most significant results first. I'm a huge fan of this. Huge fan. Tell us more. 80-20 principle. So the overall concept here is they went and did research and found that 80% of the traffic was on 20% of the streets. 80% of the pee pods gave off no, I'm sorry, 20% of the pea pods gave off 80% of all the peas in a little bush that produces peas. They found out that 20% of the activities most people do produce 80% of the results they're looking for. And, and so they just saw this principle over and over and over and over again in work and life and people and traffic and plants and birds and animals and everything in between. And so the principle says, what are the 20% of most important activities that yield 80% of the results you're trying to accomplish. Prioritize those first. That doesn't mean it's going to handle everything, but it should handle, if done right, it should create 80% of the intended results just by those 20% of activities. A and so this process of figuring out what are the most important 20% of activities that you can focus on getting done in the beginning, at first, the first things you do, and ideally, that's going to get you 80% of the way to the result you're trying to get to. And so this is fun. What's the 20% of fitness activities you can do that will produce 80% of you staying healthy, fit, you know, and having vitality and energy all the time? What's the 20% habit or activity you can put in place that produces 80% of the magic with your spouse and the ones you love? That most important thing you do every day that causes that spark to light up between you both? What's the 20% of activities you can do in your sales that drive 80% of your results? This is where you can go down every category of life and business and identify the most important activity that produces the majority of the results. And these things you can go back a step and anchor in to your time blocks to make sure these things absolutely must get done every day no matter what. Other things you can fit in as you can kind of pepper them around the schedule, but these 20% of activities that produce 80% of the results are your absolute must on the commitments. I love this so much because, <laughs> first of all, your stories are phenomenal. Your recall and stories of pea pods and the 80-20 rule <laughs> is really remarkable. Uh, one thing that you've said before regarding prioritizing tasks and leveraging that 80 20 rule you say what's the thing what is the thing that takes the least amount of effort but reduces but produces the maximum reward what's the thing that takes the least amount of effort or energy or time or whatever but it produces so much do those things and when at first when i heard that i thought like isn't that kind of lazy like you're doing the thing with the least amount of effort, but when you think about it, it's about efficiency. So I love this so much, and I love that uh, how you share it because it's so smart. Yep. It's so smart. Doing something that takes the most amount of effort or most amount of energy does not guarantee maximum results. Now, some things may, you know, like may equate or, or you know, equal out, but w the way you explain that makes your brain filter things so much differently and it's so beautiful on the topic of productivity and this this show today it's not about doing more for the sake of doing more in fact it's quite the opposite it's how do we how do we do exactly that how do we do whatever it is that we need to do in a way that's just more efficient to get more out of it not giving more and more of ourselves like d depleting ourselves and putting more on our plate and running ourselves into the ground. We're not trying to just do that. You know what I mean? Become robots and productivity monsters. What we're trying to do is actually 
out of every minute, how do we make it count in such a way that we get more time back, more uh, freedom back in our lives to do the things that we really want to do? And, and when it comes to relationships, one thing that I love that you mentioned was uh, in your relationship. And I thought, well, should you just like do every, like do whatever? And the idea is like, you could go around exhausting yourself and always putting out a ton of effort, right? into your relationship but if you're not doing but if there's little return on it like if you went and i don't know you could do buy me a new car and i'd be like wow that's amazing like cool that took a lot of time energy effort to go and do to to make the money to go and pick it out to surprise me versus if you just pick me a wildflower off the street on our walk i would just melt and it would be the sweetest thing in the world And so I think that it's so beautiful where sometimes we think if I put more effort and energy into it, it will return that same or greater amount. And that's not always true. And I think that if we're really clear on that truth, that it's not always true that the more effort you put in, the more you push yourself, the more you'll get out of it. In fact, you'll find so much freedom on the other side when you actually flip that and you go, what's the least amount? of effort and energy I can put into this to get the maximum amount. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna work hard. That doesn't mean you're not gonna put energy in. It simply means you're going to make sure that you're not overlooking some really simple, efficient tasks or things you can do for a huge return and great dividends and actually get and, and, and save that energy and your resources for other things as well. Yeah. There's the, the thought that goes around this is really important. It's being efficient with your resources. And so there's there's lots of stories that go with this, but the simplest way to describe it is if we were trying to climb Mount Everest and we could only take so much resources with us, meaning so much water and so much food in our backpacks, we have to then be very intelligent of when and where we use the resources to make sure we get to the place we're trying to go safe with food, with water, and survive the journey. And so it's this concept of, ah, I need to be very intelligent of what I'm willing to use resources-wise, and then I need to make sure I'm putting in enough to get the result that's needed and not wasting resources. And so you start to get really efficient. I think something that helped me learn this was probably living in a village in Uganda there was very little resources there, meaning they didn't have running water, they didn't have electricity, they didn't have toilets. So we had to figure out how do we use the maximum ability of the resources we have to make the most of every day. And so to, you know, to get drinking water, I had to walk a quarter mile down the road, fill up two jerry cans, and then carry them all the way back, which is like a strongman competition in itself, just to get the water there. Then we had to boil the water just to then let it cool and hopefully a bug doesn't fall in it to keep it sanitary that we could then drink it as soon as it cools later that day. So to get a glass of water took an extraordinary amount of effort. And it was like, ugh, that's a lot of effort to get a single glass of water. Versus, hey, let's save up and get a filtration pen. One of those straws you can drink straight out of the river with and it actually filters the water and makes it clean enough that it's sanitary and you can drink it and it's good for your body. I was like, man, that's one of those 80-20 things. You just saved me a quarter mile walk two directions. You just saved me boiling water. You just saved all those activities through having one productivity tool that you can use to get the same outcome of healthy, sanitary drinking water. And it's like, ah, there it is. That's the 80-20 with, with sanitary drinking water when traveling like that. And and so it's looking for what are those things that make the difference? The other question you might ask here, specifically in relationships, what is the difference that makes the difference? Because we might be doing a lot of activities to try to wow or love on or care for someone, and only one of those activities might actually matter to that person. And so we might be going like fireworks and fairy tales and storybooks. and We're we're throwing everything out there being like, look at what I'm doing for you. And to them, they're like, that one flower made all the difference. Just give me one of those every day. And you're like, really? I mean, I didn't need to do all these things. I just needed this one thing that was actually important to you. 
And so it's a concept of can you find out what's the, th what's the difference that actually makes the difference? This is for your relationships. This is client retention. This is team member retention. If you want to know why people are sticking around, you have to know what is the difference that makes the difference to them? What matters most? Those are the things to put your energy into. And now you can cut back resources on all the other random stuff and just focus on being extraordinary at doing the thing that makes the biggest difference. Uh, let's see, number six, stay active. Incorporate regular physical activity into your day. This can and will be maybe a brief walk for a few moments or stretching or a quick workout, but physical activity boosts mental clarity and energy. This is funny. Okay, so one thing that always makes me chuckle a little bit you is chuckle? when I see, yeah, when I see someone, like? when I see someone working on a building or doing manual labor, and then I go to work out for an hour, but they're doing manual labor with their body all day long. It to me, it's kind of crazy because I'm like, wow, I have to make sure I'm moving my body for an hour or something. Meanwhile, it's built into their day. And it's such a reflection of our culture today. We're so sedentary because we're just working in a sitting, like at a desk, at a computer, most people nowadays, yeah. and we're not moving. But our bodies were designed to move. And so if you think even back generations and generations ago, when m most people were working, you know, whether they're hunting or gathering or whatever it was, they were moving their bodies most of the day, right? It wasn't just sitting sedentary at a desk at a computer, obviously. So <laughs> we have to honor what our, how our bodies were built and what they were built for and work that in. It's actually really unhealthy how we're working these days. So if we can take a moment, so not just your hour though, not just your hour in the morning or your time in the evening, but throughout the day to get up, to move your energy. I love the idea too. Um, if you're going from meeting to meeting to meeting, take five minutes to just let your brain at least calm down and like collect its energy to, to build up your own internal energy, to get a snack, to fuel your body, um, to move your body. It's so important. And whatever it is, whether it's a few minutes of stretching or a little workout or some breath exercise or getting outside. I don't know about you, but if I ever need a recharge, if I walk outside and I step into the sun and the sun just shines on me, my, it's like my cells are tingly and alive again. It's so good. So without a doubt, you, we've got to stay active. We have to, we have to do that. There's nothing more important when it comes to work and our well-being than taking breaks to honor ourselves and honor our body and our brains and to move them so good for you yeah um i'm obviously a huge fan of this i think taking a walk taking a i, I did a walk and talk meeting yesterday morning i'm so glad you did that i heard you doing that and i'm so glad and that was such a perfect meeting to do it because you know you weren't coaching someone you weren't in a creative flow you're like you were just having a chat with them and you were doing that um i have a question <laughs> Can you talk about the the, the, the so problems that have come from, though, not moving when so you have taken too many calls and just sitting? So yesterday I did a walk and talk where I had a meeting that popped up. I was running late because I was focusing on a conversation my wife and I were having. And, and I was watching my workout time like squish, squish, squish. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to miss it. I only have 10 minutes to get a full workout. And like that's not going to happen. And so I thought about it and I was like, you know what? One, I used to have a treadmill desk that I actually miss, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to figure out if I can get this call to work on the treadmill. So I went down into to our treadmill, and I figured out if I get the phone just close enough to the door, it picks up a little bit of the Wi-Fi signal, and it was just enough for a Google Meets meeting that I could do a face-to-face -face conversation on the treadmill while walking for 35 minutes, so I, I got you know two miles in and the conversation and had a lot of fun and was able to hop in the sauna right after and get my whole morning routine in just because I threw it into a walk and talk mode. Um, there's something special about that. I think one of the coolest gifts you ever got me was a treadmill desk where the desk came up high. There was a little treadmill underneath it. You could turn it on 1.5 to 2.0 2 speed. 
So I could be walking and talking. I would walk and do coaching calls. I'd walk and do uh, meetings. I would walk and do a podcast. Like I just walk and talk the whole day and I'd get in miles and miles of movement. Um, now the flip side of what you're bringing up is from sitting too long. Yeah, I actually, and I think it w- might've been the way I was sitting or the chair. I mean, I wouldn't have bought a f- fancy chair and it was supposed to be ergonomic and all this stuff. But from sitting too much, my lower back and hips started to get jammed. And so luckily, we have a phenomenal, phenomenal resource we use that I've been working out with since I was 13 years old, uh, the Egoscu method, egoscu.com. I worked out, you know, reached out to Brian. I said, Brian, can I send you my my pictures of my body? And, And do you see anything funky here? And he literally sent me back a picture. And he's like, dude, what the hell happened to you? I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, here, let me show you what I see. And it was a picture where my my ears, shoulders, no, ears, neck, shoulders, hips, knees, and f- ankles are supposed to be on this straight line. And it's like there was a line, and then my body was just angled straight off the line. And I was like, oh, shoot, what happened? And he's like, dude, are you sitting too much? And I thought about it. And I went, wow, I didn't think about that. I I was so busy getting stuff done, and I'm aware of this. I know this. I've practiced this stuff since I was 13 years old. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me. I'm like, I have been sitting a ton, and I didn't even think about it. And it literally threw my whole body out of whack just by not keeping it moving all day. And, And so he laughed at me. He's like, you know better than this. Come on. And so I've done my best now to start getting out of the chair regularly. So walking more, stretching more, getting my stretches in in the morning, at night, just finding a way to get my body moving in different ways consistently to prevent it from getting locked back into that hip and hip and, and leg joint getting all jammed up again. So sitting too long definitely can wreak havoc on your body. Number seven, continuous learning. The modern work landscape is ever evolving regarding upgrading your skills through online courses, webinars, reading relevant books and articles. Constantly be learning, constantly be improving yourself. What do you think about this? You're incredible at this. I think you are such a great example of diving into not being stubborn about or even you're just not stubborn about learning more ever. And even the things you've already learned about, you'll even go deeper into. So I think that you're just a prime example of how continuous learning can really pay off. Even if something seems obvious, like the time management example was so great. You're like, well, yeah, obviously, but like, this is where our ego can slow us down. Oh, I already know that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like what's this going to teach me that's new? It's like, well, Looks like you've dropped into a fixed mindset instead of a growth mindset and figuring out what is there I can learn from this and or how could I do what I'm currently doing better, right? Or a refresher. Maybe you know it and you're doing it, but you've kind of like slacked off on it. So I I think that just from this conversation, it's you've brought up so many examples of people or places or courses or things that you've invested in into your personal growth and it's paid off tremendously when it comes to productivity even the craziest things i remember when we first met you're so organized on your desktop i've never seen anything like it. it's phenomenal and you said that it came from investing in a person that helped you learn final cut pro and so he was doing his own editing for a while and still does sometimes and because he invested in this person to teach him a program they taught him how to organize your files and your folders and everything and it's spilled out into so many other areas it's not just your your editing stuff it's everything on your computer which also then allows you to to categorize it in your head so if you need something you pull it like it's so easy for you to find for me like check in with me in a week like (laughs) i I need to do better at this i i'm a great learner i love learning um I, i i without a doubt I feel like one thing I really admire about you is you prioritize it at such a high level. Like I do it, um, but I sometimes, I probably could time chunk it more. Like this is my learning time. 
whereas you you always are getting it in yeah which is incredible and and also too i would say my advice to myself i was self-coaching myself would be like i what i know about myself is i love doing things with people so uh i have done best when i do a learning course a program or something with someone else and so when we do things together, I get so much more out of it than me just doing it. That's just the personality thing of me. I love doing things with people. So whatever it is for you, whoever's listening, um, if you know you need to do it and you're not doing it, ask yourself, what would help me be able to do this? What's, if I could have it all my way or if I had a magic wand, what would it look like? And for me, it'd be like, well, I would do it at this time or that time or I do it with this person or I would do this course or whatever that looks like. But schedule it in and, and find out your rhythm to, to invest into learning for yourself. And h- one last thing is, uh, I forget where I learned this, but I thought it was so beautiful. What a nod it is or a gift it is to yourself subconsciously to say I'm worth it, to invest in myself, mm-hmm. into my learning, into my growth. Like your soul just that's a way to nourish yourself your being right and so if nothing else just do that as a gift for yourself right yeah um somewhere along the way i learned lots of little things so leaders are learners leaders are readers i learned 10 pages a day no matter what is an absolute must to keep your mind thriving I read research around old people who are preventing dementia or memory loss or Alzheimer's. All these people were avid readers and always learning about stuff. So there was all these benefits, pains to avoid, gains to get. Um, But then there was, I forget what book it was. I think it was Mastery by George Leonard. But it was one of those books where it talked about the ultimate sign of a master of any concept is when they decide to become an eternal student of it. Mm -hmm. And I went, wow, the ultimate sign of someone who has truly mastered any concept, they've mastered it, is because they've committed to being an eternal student of it, meaning they never stop learning about it. They're always finding the new thing, the next thing, the next thing, the rendition, the revert, you know, the updated version, the new insight, the new adjustment. And it's the ability to not learn 10,000 punches, as Bruce Lee says. I don't fear the guy who knows 10,000 punches. I I fear the guy who knows one punch and has practiced it 10,000 times. And it's that concept of your ability to know a concept and be committed to learning it and seeing it through your filter, through their filter, through a different filter, through, through re-see it through your filter, but at a different stage of your journey in life. That commitment to constantly be diving into it brings such richness. It brings mastery of the concept and it, it brings a humbleness. I, I think it was also reinforced. I remember when I was a young coach, I was 18 years old, And one of my very first clients who signed up was a gentleman who was in his 50s, who was wildly successful, who had already been a corporate executive for many years, who had already built and scaled multiple companies, who ran organizations, who was also certified and trained as a coach, and he hired me as a coach. And I remember feeling intimidated. I remember feeling on that first call like, did he pick the right name? Are you sure he asked for me? Huh. And I remember I, I'm, I'm quite blunt and just transparent. Like, I'll just throw it on the table if I'm thinking about it. And so the very first call, the very first thing I said to him is, why'd you pick me? I'm new. I'm only 18. I've never scaled a company at this point. I, I, I'm still finishing my own undergraduate work in psychology. I'm just learning how to be a coach. Why me? And he laughed, and he said, that's the exact reason why I picked you. And I went, huh? And he says, because if I would have picked someone like me who's been around the block 10 times, who's been learning this stuff forever, they're going to have read the same books. They're going to have the same perspective. They're going to have come to many of the same conclusions. I'm not going to get anything new and fresh. The reason I asked for you is I want someone who doesn't have all the biases that I have to take a look at my situation and see if they can spot anything that I can't see myself. And I went, ooh, I didn't realize there was value in a fresh perspective. 
there is value in hearing or seeing a reflection from someone who doesn't know all the things you know and can't see the things you've seen and doesn't have the experience you have because they're fresh, they're new. They see it totally differently. They don't have the same lessons that were taught to you along the way. They don't have the same heartaches or headaches that came along the journey. They look at it and go, what about this? What about that? They just throw it out there and it seems like a fresh new idea that's never been thought of before and they're super excited about it. And so having people like that in my life who were eternal students, who were humble enough and excited to say, hey, I've checked all the boxes, won all the awards, have all the accomplishments, have done all the things. I'm gonna put myself in a room with someone who's never seen this stuff and ask them to look at it and give me their opinion. And I was like, wow, that's a master of their craft. I've worked with other people who, even though they would act humble, in their own mind, always believed they were the smartest person in the room. And I've been taught over the years, never be the smartest person in the room. You are in the wrong room if you're the smartest person. Yeah. And if you think you're the smartest person, you're probably on your path to a slow mental decline and painful future. And the only reason I say that is because you stop accepting new. You stop accepting new ideas and new thoughts and new perspectives. And the moment you get stuck in that, it becomes a spiral of death emotionally and psychologically over time. So don't land up in a death spiral. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Number eight, avoid burnout, especially with concepts like the four-hour work week. It's essential to focus on effectiveness over time spent working. Take regular breaks, practice mindfulness, and ensure you have personal time. So I think we covered this a little earlier. Totally. Um, but it's just the concept of be really efficient with your time, meaning pick the most important things, use the 80-20 rule, have boundaries, all of these things play into this one, and they help you avoid burnout. Also, having personal time scheduled in, having that movement scheduled in, having friends to regularly connect with and catch up with all help. Uh, number nine, stay connected while working remotely. It's easy to feel isolated, so regularly check in with colleagues, even if it's just a brief chat. This can foster collaboration and help maintain a team spirit. So this is really important. I've definitely experienced the work from home by myself loneliness that can come up, meaning you're just working, 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 early mornings, long evenings, you get done, there's no one else there, you're all by yourself, and it's like, now what? Kind of like someone to spend some time with. You know, what do I do? I didn't, I didn't make time to go connect with humans. I didn't make time to go have a chat with a friend. Oof. And, and so I, I think this one's really important, especially all the research shows. So there was the longest study done at Harvard University. It's a multi-generational study that's been passed down from research team to research team, all following the same people. And they found out that the people who live the longest are the happiest and earn the most. So how long you live, how happy you are, and how much you earn all came down to having a powerful peer group having community around you, the friends you chose to spend time with. And the number one factor, when they pulled apart all the research, having someone to regularly talk with each and every day, what they found was lowered the baseline stress level for people, which caused them to land up living longer, feeling happier, and earning more. And so this concept of regularly communicating with others, especially if you're working from home by yourself, um, it is very, very important, not only to stay connected and have friends and, and people you feel and you can thrive with, also for if you wanna live longer, if you wanna be happy, if you wanna earn more, you need that group to just connect with, according to Harvard, to at least lower the stress level. What are your thoughts on this? You're a very people -y person. It was the hardest thing for me when I transitioned from working in an office to working from home. It was the hardest thing. I love people. I love being around people. I have been told by managers and leaders and directors of mine that they didn't want me to work from home because when I was in the office, I helped bring the morale up. 
So I really thrive in that environment. It is the thing that though we don't have an office, when I think about people like this whole movement of work from home, I can understand how it's just easier and more convenient in so many ways. And I think from a company culture perspective, oof, like where's the time to like bond and connect and to go to lunch together and to laugh over silly things around the office and stuff. And I really, I feel for people that don't have that. Like they, whether it's a remote position, I don't know. I just, I have a lot of feelings around this. I think it, I feel it personally. I think that working remote can absolutely be super isolating. So if you're going to do it, if you choose to do it or you have to do it, then make it a point to go schedule a lunch out with someone or go to a place that is more communal to connect. Like maybe you join a co-working space where there are people that you can chat with and connect with. But this, we are humans and humans are meant to be together. We're not, we're not the type of mammals that are meant to be living by ourselves at all. It's not good for health. There's so many studies, like you said, that shows that staying connected and having community is important. So figure that out. And I, if, if, <laughs> If I worked at in corporate again, I would probably opt for exactly what we do now, which is I'll do three days in the office and I want my Mondays and Fridays at home. And the, the key thing is, is that you're still hitting the mark. And there's a part on like your, obviously your company of, of tracking that, but then also on your own personal integrity of, of doing what you say you're going to do and doing and, and upholding those responsibilities that you're, uh, that you have for your work and then that find that harmony within your life. But if you do one or the other, regardless, it's important that you're staying connected because you could be in the office and totally just be grinding and never go out for a lunch either and never be connecting with your, your peers. So uh, it's equally important there. But uh, if you're home, obviously, it's going to take a lot more effort. Yeah. So do it. I, I, I totally, I, it's so lonely sometimes. <laughs> and that's why... I am always probably moving and buzzing and, and trying to find people in my space because I love people. So anyway, shout out to all the extroverts out there. Number 10, set clear goals and review regularly. Know what you're aiming for. Weekly or even daily reviews can help you assess your progress, adjust priorities, and even stay on track. There is this concept called the 20 mile march that we're both big fans of. And it's uh, based out of a book by Jim Collins. Do you remember the name? Good to great. Good, good to great. Interesting. Um, I thought it was something else, but anyways, so. So in the book, he talks about there's two people trying to go across the United States. They're both starting in Los Angeles. They're both trying to get to Washington, DC. One person, like Amanda was saying, um, on the sunny days, instead of doing 20 miles, they feel lots of energy, so they do 50 miles. The next day they wake up and they feel tired and sore, so they decide to just rest. The next day it rains, so they stay bunkered in and decide not to go. The next day it's sunny again, so they, you know, they get 60 miles in, but then they feel exhausted. And then it rains again and they're bunkered down. And so they have this rhythmic pattern of on the best days, they try to do everything all at once, and then on the worst days, they kind of just hunker down and do nothing. Then they took person two. This person, like Amanda said, committed to 20 miles every day, no matter what. They moved 20 miles in the rain. They moved 20 miles in the sunshine. They moved 20 miles uh, in the snow. They moved 20 miles at night. They moved 20 miles in the day. Like they just made 20 miles happen. And then they would force themselves to rest. Even if they had more energy, even if they could have gone further, they forced themselves to shut it down and rest. They never had a day where they felt exhausted or tired or, or overwhelmed because they were only going 20 miles and then resting. And when they came down to the amount of time it took, it took half the time for the people who were doing 20 miles a day, no matter what, to get across the entire country. By the time they reached Washington, D.C., the person who was doing the sprint and the stop and the rest and then the not go in the rain and then the sprint and then the rest and the stop, the wonky schedule... They only made it halfway across the United States by the time the other person had already arrived at the destination. And so that consistency, the long time historical story that sums this up is the tortoise and the hare. 
It's been told to many of us since we were kids. They have fairy tale or, or the, you know, these kid examples where the rabbit sprints and then rests and then hurts and then sprints and the little turtle just does its 20 mile march every single day and ultimately in the end the rabbit gets distracted, shiny object syndrome, all these other things. The turtle just keeps doing its little 20 mile march every day and eventually crosses that finish line before the rabbit does and the rabbit is shocked. How could this turtle have beat me? And it comes down to rhythmic, consistent progress no matter what. And so, where do you need more rhythmic, consistent progress in your life, in your business? Where can you lock in? I will move this 15 feet further every day no matter what. And as long as I've got my 15 feet of progress, I will check it off and be done for the day. It is a game changer once you lock it in. The book was great by choice. Ah, great by choice. Good book.